Thank you everyone for coming and being here. I know it's a hard time to be uh, sitting uh, in front of our computers to, to listen to a lecture. But thank you for sparing the time to uh, come and listen uh, to this lecture. Siguru, just before I begin, um, I would just like to acknowledge um, the, ma, the, the person who advised me through this version of this paper, uh, Dr. Ruth Pison. She's not here, but because uh, she, she has to be at the uh, College of Music um, search for uh, Dean. But uh, I would just like to acknowledge and recognize that she helped me through several drafts of this version. So please allow me to read this paper to you on the materiality of criticism, limiting evidence from absence in early film writings in the Philippines. So a few points of departure. <clears throat> in 1913, a priest started the earliest known film column published in the Philippines, The Espectaculos, or The Shows. A regular monthly column included as part of the Spanish language Catholic magazine, Cultura Social, Revista Católica Filipina, from 1913 to 1914. In this paper, I examine articles from this column through a realist historiographic and historical anthropological lens to draw out the, the content and context of an early kind of criticism that made a bid for the controlling narrative that would define critical practices and traditions in Philippine film, and to an extent, Philippine studies in general. In this way, I attempt a resuscitation of cultural memory through an ethnography of critical practice. This is the uh, particular historical audience pieced together from the writings in Cultura Social, as part and parcel of the struggle to rename archival absence in Philippine film and historiography into a generative condition for discursive agency. This research forms a part of my master's thesis, The Sense and Sensation of Cinema, A History of Early Film Writings in the Philippines, which I wrote to get my degree in, in media studies film. However, it's not a critical project to trace a history of cinematic ideas in the Philippines through a realist mode of historiography is anchored on the rigor of literary analysis to examine the early language of film writings and glean, first, how film was discursively produced during this early, these early years as scientific knowledge, technology, art medium, and cultural object. And second, and perhaps more compellingly, how film was imbricated through the critical language of these early writings into defined historical narratives that would germinate hegemonic critical traditions in Philippine film criticism. Presenting this study as a tenure lecture for the English department uniquely accentuates questions about interdisciplinary, literature-based research and critical practice. Admittedly, when I first presented this for my thesis, there were also questions on whether it's a film study, since there isn't a single film examined in it. And yet an interdisciplinary approach to the historical study of film in the Philippines is less a challenge than it is a necessity. Research on Philippine cinema, as Bliss Kua Lim describes, is, circums is circumscribed by acute temporal pressures of archival crisis, whereby an estimated 73% of films produced in the country have been lost to the ravages of time, and among the oldest of them that has been preserved and yeah, that has been preserved dates back only to 1936, more than three decades since the cinematograph was introduced in 1897. Yet in the absence of early films to study, it remains that, quote, what we can know of the past is limited to the historical traces of it that exist in the present, quote, unquote. And this, quote again, absence of inaccessibility of traditional sources of data should be an invitation to look for evidence in unusual, if not exotic places. That's from Allen and Gomery. Ironically then, the absence of a film corpus becomes the enabling condition for contemporary scholars to employ innovative interdisciplinary strategies to study Philippine film history and, uh, in and through literature, a term which I will use in this study in a very general sense to refer to written texts rather than canonical ones, such as the film writings and articles included in this corpus. Certainly the corpus of the study itself may be deemed even within literary studies, or at least until recent history, exotic. Magazines and periodicals, like films, have had to fight seriously for recognition and legitimacy as objects of enduring value. 
a Catholic magazine like Cultura Social, with its unapologetic moral bias, is likewise vexed, popular, quote-unquote, in the sense that it may be deemed as unscholarly, unscientific, and, and, and given to religious propaganda. As one of the few remaining means to study film at the beginning of the 20th century, it poses questions to what can be considered in scholarly studies as valid texts for analysis. But an interdisciplinary approach circumvents the question of validity in order to, more importantly, increase our sense of the participants in history allowing us to understand cinema as located and produced within a broad and complex web of discursive practices, including critical literatures, fan cultures, academic iterations, industry mores, and legal codes. The work of examining films through archival writings expands the number of interpretable texts. To begin to chart the relationships between and make meaning from various discursive practices, to treat movies as aspects of a complex system of cultural production. In this view, the literary cannot be disengaged from, from the cinematic, as both are implicated in social and cultural production of cinematic knowledge, and therefore of cinematic audiences. Within the framework of realist historiography, these writings do not just generate discourse, but produce real people the textual and discursive are involved in the material production of life. This realist mode of film historiography necessitates a view of the writings in the corpus, not just as discursive iterations, but as factual evidence of events and human actions that occurred in history. In modern literary studies, with its postmodern suspicion of, of fixed meanings in discourses, this historical anthropological view that texts produce their objects as real, that is, as existing, prior to and outside of discourse, may be seen as teetering dangerously toward blind positivism. However, the concept is more nuanced in practice. Rather than the study of a people in a particular place and at a certain time, what is at stake in historical anthropology is explaining the production of a people and the production of space and time. In other words, historical anthropology is anchored on an awareness of the text of history as a field of power in which facts about human life are embodied in narratives that do not just represent but produce social norms and relations. Likewise, the film writings being examined in this study create a historical narrative that attempt to both examine and determine cultural behaviors. But in reading literature, not just as discourse, but as material evidence of history, the residual imprints of what existed outside of the text are also possible to surface and exude. This insistence on the literary as real in the reflexive sense that the real subverts the figurative and discursive, even as in the case of undocumented film audiences, it can only exist figuratively and subversively, and discursively, discursively sorry. It is powerful as both a critique and strategy of historiography. Thus, toward a view of the literary as a material agent in the production of knowledge, this study employs strategies of rigorous literary analysis through a meta-historical and historical anthropological reading of archival writings on cinema in order to offer itself as three things. Yes. Uh, a theoretical contribution toward an interdisciplinary handling of textual criticism. Second, an attempt at a reflexive history of knowledge, particularly of multisensorial cinema in the Philippines. And third, an interrogation of critical practice itself by looking at the questions asked of dominant traditions of film criticism by archival evidence and archival absence. Let's go to... Cultura Social, the magazine. Cultura Social was a Spanish language Catholic magazine that published from 1913 to 1941. Endorsed by the Archbishop and headed by a line of priest editors, it, was, it published monthly and was a principal title among several small but relatively stable, that's Menores Bastante Established por lo General, Spanish language periodicals that began to publish in limited circulation around the country over a decade after the ceding of the Philippines to its new American colonizers. Described to be of very conservative content, 
Kultura Social published, published, sorry. Kultura Social published during the time of expansion of the Catholic press within the new colonial structure. It was driven by a church that had overcome the difficult early years of the century and continued to contend with a strong anti-clericalism emphasized by the clergy's association with the colonial Spanish regime. These were the conditions of Cultura Social's emergence when it began publication in 1913 with a column, with a column de Espectaculos. What might very well be the first, the earliest film review column in the country. However, before entering the discussion, a discussion of the film writings themselves, the conditions of writing during these early years must be examined with some more depth. It goes without saying that one of the most enduring limitations of writing and criticism is the space of discourse they occupy. In a country where literacy and numeracy have for the longest time been confined to the upper classes, film writings predictably have had a, limited, have had a significantly limited audience. And one cannot exaggerate the influence of cultura social during this period. Resil Mojares writes, with Spanish as dominant medium, limited literacy and urban bias, periodical circulations were not large. However, ideas within such periodicals did circulate in a myriad other ways. The influence of newspapers extended beyond readers. They were really points in the oral transmission of news, rumor, and gossip. As a magazine produced with the support of the Archdiocese, Cultura Social espoused ideas of the Catholic Church that were propagated broadly outside of the periodical itself. Between 1913 and September 1914, a total of 15 De Spectaculous articles were recovered from the extant archives. This count excludes the, Ju the June and July 1913 issues as these were missing from the microfilm archives of the University of the Philippines and the University of Santo Tomas. Notably, other writings on film included in Cultura Social were published under another column called En Pro de la Moral, or In Pursuit of Morality, which focused on reporting and endorsing censorship policies implemented to uphold morality in European nations. These endorsements of foreign legislations for the local Philippine setting signified on the one hand the Catholic Church's bid to secure its position in the social political life of a new colonial regime, and on the other, its active construction of a hegemonic morality defined by the values of Catholic doctrine. Evaluations based on these moral and political frameworks were then demonstrated in De Spectaculos. Two priests wrote for this column during its period of publication, Alonso de Modara, often referred in this paper as Modara for brevity, during his tenure, wrote consistently month after month, while Philadelphia, his successor, wrote less and less regularly until his contribution stopped entirely in 1914. The column's life was short-lived, but its emergence certainly represented a significant period for cinema. It was a time when the narrativization of films attributed to the advent of film adaptations of literary and theatrical works had ensured movie-going as a habit of leisure. Cinema had by then transitioned from being convenient entertainment, distracting from the atrocities of the wars, into a mainstay of cultural life. These were also years when innovators were experimenting more and more with sound on film technologies, syncing audio with visual projection, and increasing cinema's proximity to the rendering of life. After 1909 were also the years described by film historian Charles Musser, as the emergence of Philippines-based filmmaking. With the release of Yearsley's El Fusilamiento de Jose Rizal and Brown, Molina, and Gross's La Vida de Rizal in 1912. So we started filmmaking actually in 1912. After La Vida de Rizal, uh, the Rizalina Film Manufacturing Company continued to produce films in the next few years, most of them featuring their muse and Gross's wife, Juana or Tita Molina, the biggest star of the silent film era. However, the absence of locally made productions from the reviews studied here give rise to questions that reflect on the historical roots of critical practice, among the most fundamental of which is what objects warrant review. For the De Spectaculous writers, these were foreign films, mostly American, German, Italian, and French. 
But preceding to this question, of course, is the question of which objects are, in the first place, accessible for review. During the period of early cinema in the Philippines, there were a number of reasons that could have prevented the reviewers from seeing local films. For instance, cinemas changed their film programs often, changing shows every three to five days. As an example, in Alonso de Modara's May 1913 column, La Viuda Alegre, was described as an example of a resoundingly successful film. So it was screened simultaneously in at least two theaters and staying in the box office for only four days. So you know, box office, four days in two theaters. Different theaters also targeted different clientele and screened only specific types of movies. It was entirely possible that the authors missed local films or did not frequent the cinemas where Philippine-made films were screened. Clayton and Cleven, in their examinations of the style and aesthetics of film, culture, of film critical language, sorry, also point out that film reviewers typically choose to review objects that can, for the most part, be used illustratively, valued primarily for their usefulness, rather than engaged with critically or valued for their achievements. If, for the, if the De Spectaculous column was established to illustrate the moral criteria of the Catholic Church in the understanding of films, then popular films of questionable moral content were likelier to be chosen for review. If locally produced films were unremarkable in these respects, they might have garnered little critical attention. Certainly, the writers of Cultura Social prioritized certain values and ideals for pontificating both exhibited an outward-looking cosmopolitanism in writing themselves as citizens of the world, for sure because of the cosmopolitan nature of Catholicism itself. The Cultura Social articles make frequent references to policies and trends in European nations to recommend them for implementation in the Philippine Islands. They claim on the greatness of European literary texts on which some of the films they review are based and echo the refined views of the great European civilizations in, for example, their appraisal of Russian film. So here's an example of their appraisal. I'll only read the translation, but this is the original text uh, on the screen. So here, Alonso de, Mus de Mus uh, Mudara describes Russian films as uh, in this way. The poor, semi-barbaric, and unpleasant ambience of Russia are reflected in these films in stark contrast with the refinement of life and customs preferred in the French films. Alonso de Modara actually credits films by Gaumont and Pate for bringing knowledge of the world to the Philippines. In his February 1913 column, he describes how the graphic reviews of the two production companies keep us updated with the current events around the world. Very cosmopolitan in sensibility. So notably, the writers of this spectaculous in their moralism and cosmopolitanism provided a vivid contrast to the inward-looking cultural nationalism, more strongly espoused in periodicals that would eventually be canonized to shape Philippine critical traditions, such as the preponderant El Renacimiento or Muling Pagsilang and Renacimiento Filipino. The erasure is not for lack of effort to participate in the impulse to build the nascent Filipino nation at the beginning of the 20th century. The cultura social, social writers certainly articulated their concern for the nascent ideology of a small citizenry, or in their words, naciente diario de pequeña ciudadana, and attempted to steer the imagination of the nation toward a moral and cosmopolitan outlook, insofar as Western, particularly European, cultures had been and still continued to be imagined as centers of modernity, sophisticated thought, and enlightened civility. But for speaking through the voice of the colonial Hispanist, medieval, and unscientific Catholic Church, these perspectives towards cinema and popular culture would be forfeited in national or nationalist his intellectual history. It is of that over a century hence, this study now attempts to recover, to listen for stories about ourselves that we have not yet heard. In this way, it also recognizes and comes to terms with the fact that much of what we can appropriate for cultural self-definition is swathed in colonial wrappings and must necessarily be assembled from an archive at once corrupt and indispensable. So into the corrupt and indispensable archive, 
This is uh, the section on exhuming history and materializing voice. In this section of the study, I strive to examine the language of critique found in the writings of the spectaculos. This critical language, like any, participates in producing, as Rasil Mujares describes, a discourse of rulers and ruled that is not an academic conversation in a parlor, but a deep asymmetrical struggle for power. These discourses that strive to assimilate cinema into various constructions of disciplined identities constitute a textual employment of the colonized. However, in so doing, it materializes the body that it seeks to control and affirms the existence of unruly excesses to its own discourse. It is difficult to determine whether Alonso de Modar and Fidelfo, Philadelpho were Spanish, Philippine-born Spaniards, or Filipino illustrados. We construe them as native intellectuals. Given their language, both wrote exclusively in Spanish, choice of pseudonyms, masculine, and religious affiliation, Catholicism, famously patriarchal, they may be safely assumed as male and upper class. Otherwise, very little can be known of their historic personages. But while historically ver verifiable evidence remains elusive, their writings are examined here within view of how Richard Combs just observes that critics, quote, carry with them as a structure where they came from, where they are, and whom they are addressing. This is an, an aesthetic strategy or a theory of sorts that comes with the territory. In this regard, the pseudonyms of the two cultura social writers bear some discussion. Alonso de Modara is a name that broken down might be taken to mean one who battles for change. Alonso is a common Spanish name meaning eager for battle. And Modara, while having no direct translation in Spanish, might be derived from the verb mudar, meaning to change, or in the conjugated form mudara means will change, in a third person future or subjunctive register. Philadelpho, on the other hand, is a common name derived from the Greek words philos, meaning love, and adelphos, meaning of the same womb or brother, to mean consequently brotherly love. Predictably, predictably the combative complexion of Alonso de Modara and the gentle forbearance in Philadelpho are distinctly reflected in their writing styles and attitudes towards cinema, corroborating the construction of a clear subjectivity or persona that reflects the, individ the individuality and personality of this critic that is watching and writing in this way now, such that one can recognize from the aesthetic qualities of his work that this is his criticism. Alonso de Modara's writing style is distinct for its tendency toward the dramatic, often tart and acerbic, in its remonstrations rather than simply didactic, with diary-like musings and anecdotes interspersed between commentaries, and a penchant for emotional embellishments of a greater intensity than Philadelphia's compar comparably more measured expressions. His language is vivid and colorful, profuse in its praise of films he views as commendable, and scathing in its disapproval of films he views as harmful. His language is characterized by what Mojares has described as rhetorical excess that made 19th century Spanish polemics quite distinctive, employing a voice of authority in his value judgments of films that brooks no argument. No argument. Meanwhile, Philadelphia, while equally adamant in his espousal of Catholic conservative views, strives toward a more sympathetic mode of argumentation making a point of citing both good and bad aspects of cinema. A contrast to Mudara's default suspiciousness of the medium, his writings strive to understand the appeal of cinema to its audiences, building his criticisms not on the aesthetic quality of films, but on how they affect their vulnerable audiences, the corruptible children and the uneducated classes. Contrary to Mudara's unapologetic subjectiveness, Philadelphia is more scientific in his anticipation of counter arguments and is more cautionary than vilifying in his judgments, though not completely resistant to oratorical embellishment. It might be said that between the two columnists, it is Modara who closely approximates the values of the contemporary film reviewer or critic. He wrote far more regularly on film during his tenure as columnist than Philadelphia, who took over the column in November 1913. Mudara's writings lean heavily toward aesthetic criticism with a formal demeanor that evaluates what he perceives to be important aspects of film. 
it is a limited perspective. It's a limited perception, more intuitive than deliberate, marked by proselytism and moralism. But there's a method to his engagement with cinema. And beyond matters of theme and storyline, he examines its elements with some awareness of its differences from established art forms, such as theater and literature. So he had a consciousness of cinema as a form. Uh, Mudara's aesthetic criticism is largely anchored on the verissimo, or plausibility of the plot, and he lambasts, sometimes with remarkable derision, films that fail to convince him in this regard. He is particularly skeptical of coincidences, coincidences, or co coincidences in films. In his February 1913 column, he cites La Novela de un Corazón for such unlikely coincidences. So, just to give you an example. In this film, a woman commits suicide and her body is sent to the examination room of the medical school where her former lover is studying and incidentally ends up dissecting her heart. In the same article, he describes La Canson de la, de la Abuelita as a bit disastrous, almost as disastrous as the plot of the work. The film is a drama about a woman who loses her memory when the theater where she is watching an opera with her husband burns down, and she's mistaken for a ballerina with whom a count is deeply in love. Among other complaints of this disastrous plot, Mudara sniffs at the implausibility of characterization. He remarks, for instance, that one of the characters, a captain, seems to be constantly on duty because he is always wearing his uniform, even if he had just gotten out of bed. Thus, when Mudara comments on the cliché of a character's losing her memory as an overused technique in what he calls las películas catastróficas, so he emphasizes catastróficas, he gleaned that he's referring as much to a genre of films that contain catastrophes as to films that to him fall catastro catastrophically short on artistic merit. Mudara's aesthetic discourses are replete with extensive and highly editorialized summaries of films being reviewed. This editorialization of film demonstrates what film critic Adrian Martin describes as the possibilities or impossibilities for discourse to intervene in what unfolds on screen such that even the summarizing of plot becomes a practice in ekphrasis. A description, a redescription rather, that is neither literal nor naively representational. Criticism begins at, uh, according to uh, Martin, criticism begins at a stage that amounts to a secondary elaboration after the primary elaboration of the film work itself. It takes on the necessary, even sometimes militant, function of redescribing what has already been etched into the screen. Criticism in this sense doubles its object, ghosts it in a process that art critic uh, Edward Colles describes as superabundance. There is something excessive, something strictly unnecessary, perhaps even something a little diabolical in critical description. Thus, Modara's representational descriptions of the film narrative were presumably implicated in his or Cultura Social's own political project, a point that I will return to later in this discussion. Remarkably, Modara's dissatisfaction with unconvincing, implausible films seems to be underpinned by a nascent realism that would only later be theorized, much later, be theorized and articulated by the likes of Siegfried, Siegfried Krakauer and Andre Bazan. While Modara certainly did not theorize the medium specificities of cinema during his period, his insistence on cinema's fidelity to the world it is referencing appeals for cinema to record and reveal physical reality. An expectation premised on a notion of Bates the Loose that it is this realism that defines cinema's aesthetic legitimacy as a medium of cultural import. Mudara's proto-realist expectations become more discernible as a critical aesthetic when he regards non-realist films, such as Kol Vadis in his August 1913 column. He makes an exception to his conservative criteria against violence and sexuality for the Italian ep epic drama based on the historical novel. Mudara praises how admirably the film portrays the novel's narrative of an agnostic Roman general who falls in love with a Christian girl during the last few years of Emperor Nero's reign when, when Christians were being intensely persecuted. 
this is what he writes about this uh, bloody and beautiful Italian drama, he writes. Um, in the impossibility of describing the entire film, we will cite uh, we will cite salient scenes. Sorry, uh, I'm just um, later pa itong specific code. I'll just go back. In the impossibility of describing the entire film, we will cite salient scenes of the banquet in the Palace of Nero, which ends with, interestingly, a discreetly crude orgy. The beautiful presentation of the martyrs in the circus the solemn moment in which the beasts were freed and directed against their victims, the appearance of the Lord to the Apostle, and the burning of Rome as well as as well done as the unfortunate death of Petronius. So these what call salient scenes, it must be noted, included those of rather explicit and or grisly content, including suicidios, suicidos, sorry, the death of Petronius by cutting his wrists, incendios or fires. And even a discret discretamente crudo orgy, discreetly crude orgy. Images that one would not expect a conservative and moralizing clergyman to appreciate nor approve. In his defense, he writes that the film's pitfalls have been this slide. Masterfully saved. Where is it? Masterfully saved, there you go. Because there's nothing so close to the vulgar as the sublime. So that's how he excuses it. Of course, Budara's deviation from his moral criteria for a film like Quo Vadis can be easily attributed to a preference for religious and pro-Christian themes. But it, it's the same proto-realist impulse that makes him complain in his March 1913 column. How Una Fuga Interrumpida, that's another film, is a love story, but it doesn't feature a single kiss. Even though one might expect a conservative clergyman to be, to be relieved that the film spares its audiences images of such intimacies. Yet Mudara's moral criteria, which is inevitably political in impulse, is not unconnected with his aesthetic criteria. When he comments his in his February 1913 column that El Rey de Bosque, another film, was not very realistic, but that it was at least able to move without harming anyone. One understands how Mudara links the inimitable, inimitable the, sorry, Mudara links the imitable lives that cinema produces on screen and their possible material influence on life itself, such that a realistic and moral cinema would hypothetically produce a real and moral audience. He denounces excessively violent and bloody films in his May 1913 column, saying such films are worse than the worst sensational literature. This view foregrounds the more visceral impact of cinema on its audiences than of literature on its readers, such that film's aesthetic quality as a medium that both references and affects life amplifies by making real, on screen and in real life, a film's moral values. Mudara's concern that film reality depicts lived reality as mas horribles than it truly is, is underpinned by a belief that film, because of its unique relationship with life or reality, is able to imbue its depictions with life. A belief that links and necessitates, by consequence, the censorship and control of film in order to control life. In the same vein, Modara is concerned about the effects of cinema on literature itself. He complains in his January 1930, 1913 article how Bad films encouraged the growth of bad literature. During this period, cinema had begun to rely heavily on literary classics such as Don Quixote, Les Miserables, and Covades for inspiration. And Mudara correctly perceived this relationship between film and literature as both material or economic and moral with their shared audiences, shared income, and shared values. In terms of critical practice, this early privileging of a narrative which Mudara underscores as cinema's responsibility for the promotion of good literature, would also contribute to the eventual dominance of narrative cinema as the proper object of film criticism. So you don't see many criticism in film on other types, animation, short films, um, documentary, voilà. uh, narrative cinema is the cinema to critique. 
Philadelphia took over the Espectaculos in November 1913. Notably, unlike Madaras, Philadelphia's articles tend to examine broad genres rather than particular films. For instance, he has dedicated articles on what he calls Obras de Sentimiento and Apachista films. Philadelphia's generic treatment of films is useful to him as a rhetorical strategy to critique not just films in particular, but societal attitudes implicated in the appreciation of films in general. When he does mention specific films, it is usually only as a springboard, springboard for talking about general perceptions of the genre. For example, he uses his experience of watching Salustiano y el Hormiguera to talk about the appeal and positive effects on the spirit of good comedy. Or he examines Amor de Madre to commend restraint in drama films. He even has an article entirely unrelated to film on ragtime, in which he talks about the ca cabaret style of dancing called rag that was gaining popularity in the Philippines during that period. One might surmise then that Philadelphia was less interested in segregating good from bad films, as his predecessor had attempted to do, than in understanding and evaluating trends in Philippine popular cultural life. To this end, Philadelphia takes a more sociological, quasi-scientific route in his criticism, tempering his moral claims with objective of argumentation, quote-unquote, objective argumentation, underpinned by a view of cinema's influence as not by default harmful, but potentially educational. In his February 1914 article, he writes that film is a very valuable auxiliary that must be used as any modern, progressive, synthetic system of objective representation. In a September 1914 article, Philadelphia's claim to impartiality results in a lengthy summary of the film El Pato al Colbert, without any value judgment, comment, or opinion, except for a cheeky quip that the title perplexes him because he did not see any doc in the film. This objective summary of the film may be read as an effort on the part of the clerical intelligentsia to assimilate aspects of the modern preoccupation with scientific and rational thought into Catholic discourse. During these decades, the Catholic Church was waging a battle against European Enlightenment that had taken a decidedly anti-Catholic cast, and Catholic devotees needed to contend with intellectual trends that rejected the traditional teachings of the Church. The attempt in Philadelphia's writings to be impartial while continuing to espouse correct values of morality, truthfulness, and civility in the final evaluation can be read as an attempt to demonstrate how, far from being a closed medieval system, Catholicism was a tradition of thought capable of renewing itself and assimilating modern science. But more than germinating a kind of genre approach to films in his broad stroke critical appraisals of comedies, dramas, and crime films, Philadelphia's generalized critiques of typical films also provided the rhetorical function of giving his moral ideological propagandizing added elocutionary force. To illustrate, among his commentaries, his discourse on Apachista films in, in February 1914 bears the strongest iteration of what can be construed as an early mode of proto-genre criticism. Here he describes a film done in the style of Apachismo. Here he describes uh, a film done in the style of Apachismo, seemingly an early reference to the Western crime genre. So this is how he describes it. Full of violent, daring, and sensational characters in which the protagonists are gentlemen in teal coats, sporting automobiles, masked with false beards, and occasionally revolvers. Until the providential detective, an astute, ingenuous, ingenuous, ingenious, sorry, lean and tenacious man with a greyhound sense of smell, manages to capture the entire band of Apaches with his intrepid captain. In this film, we counted three hikes up a mountain, two robberies, a poisoning, a kidnapping, two escapes, a frustrated suicide, two murders, and a fire. Yet this description does not continue into a genre critique of a particular Apachista film. Instead, he recounts that a boy around eight, year, around eight years old sat next to him in the theater and was so anxious and fearful throughout the viewing. So this is his description of the boy next to him. He would get up, tiptoe, clap, sit back down, hit the seat in front of him with his feet, laugh nervously, shudder, in short, everything, 
When in the end, the boy buries his face into his mother's lap, Philadelphia describes the chiquillo as exhausted by the violence, fatigado por la violencia. And when he comes down toward the film's Denoma, as captivated by, says the child was captivated by the display of justice. Or, Arrebatado por esa fuerza de su maria justicia. He laments that the scene is just one among many happening all over Manila, especially in popular, inexpensive cinemas that are always full of children. Philadelphia's sensory descriptions of the boy's response to the film corroborates how all description is a series of fiction with a fictional impulse at its heart. This fictionalization accomplishes Philadelphia's greater advocacy for the proper, i.e. Catholic Christian education of children, as it strengthens both his notions of how influential film could be and how damaging to a child's well-being left unchecked. This fictionalized account further fulfills a rhetorical function in convincing and assimilating audiences into the Catholic Hispanic values he espouses through the emotional argument of child suffering. As Richard de Cordova points out, everyone with a complaint about the movie found references to the victimization of children to be their most powerful rhetorical tool. Likewise, in the almost oratorical mode of Philadelphia's articles, the image of the defenseless and gullible child is invoked to pontificate on responsible moral parenting. It says, two things can happen to the little viewer whose parents in their carelessness or ignorance let him go to the cinemas without, proper, without prior examination of what they are going to see. He may suffer constant nervous sh shocks that can endanger his health if he is weak, emotional, and of a rich and re restless fantasy. Or he may become accustomed to the spectacle of cruelties, violence, the daring audacities of crime, atrophying, disturbing, exhausting, the noble feelings that flourish in his soul. In either case, the damage is immeasurable. The fictionalization of the child, in effect, writes the colonial subject's body within the discourse of colonial logic through the emotional argument of children suffering in order to manage, circumscribe, and normativize the experience of cinema. This recognition of the constructedness of the child audience is not to deny the unruliness of real audiences, but to stress the researchers' and reformers' allied attempts to produce and place the audience in a certain way. In taking on a cultural and moral ascendancy over the uncritical masses, the reviews of the Cultura Social writers were as much observations on cinematic representations as they were on Filipino viewing culture. Through a realist historiographic and histor historical anthropological view, these languages of critique are able to materialize not only discursive gaps through which what they, can be, what they said can be understood as leaving out so much, but also active and unruly audiences who ultimately exceed the disciplining language that constructed them. The links drawn between spectatorship and citizenship in these discourses also foreground the role of criticism itself in the production of a, of a particular Filipino citizenry. For Mudara and Philadelphia, a citizenry defined by a, cos a cosmopolitan citizenship, implicating the literary production of Philippine modernity at the start of the 20th century in becoming a citizen of the world. I hope to have illustrated in this study a kind of interdisciplinary and reflexive approach to critical writings that positions particular languages of critique as both specifically located discursive instances and as historical evidence, an, acknowledge an acknowledgement of words as, participated, as belonging to and participating in material worlds. There is certainly much that can be explored when such an approach is taken with Philippine criticism or even literary criticism. A realist intellectual history of Philippine literary criticism may yield exciting reflections on the conditions of writing and cultures of critique they enable. What evidence of early writing cultures are revealed in archival literatures? How do writers create knowledge in the context of the academe, of the criticism workshop, of commercial publishing, of revolution? of hashtag activisms? How do critics contend with each other? How do they construct or discipline their audiences? How do they produce new readers and consumers of literature, with a capital L or otherwise? How have newspaper reviews, book clubs, literary awards, Twitter stats, citation scores, and tenure lectures create different kinds of writers and public intellectuals? How have they involved new participants and new modalities of participation 
in literary and critical practices. How is literature experienced sensorially, as printed text and as digital pixels, as transmedial adaptations and as Instagram quotes, as collectible items and limited editions, as convenient quotations for erudite speeches? In the same way that I've explored in this study what archival writings reveal of early film cultures and early cultures, all early cultures of criticism, we can explore in what Miradwe's knowledge of literature is created and consumed what languages, registers, and strategies of critique have we used and can use to study Philippine criticism itself. Ultimately, at the heart of this foray into an interdisciplinary handling of critical texts lies a proposition for new modes of critical and historiographic inquiry to provide material force to our rewritings and reorientations of historical narratives in our favor and to seek accountability for the ways that discursive articulations and the cultures of critique that produce knowledge, memory, identity, imagination, have been driven by material action and are imbricated in acts of power and continue to open up new paths to our pasts and futures. Thank you very much. All right. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Luigi, for your tenure lecture. Um, I'd like, as a uh, topic, to give the reaction uh, to the tenure lecture. So let me begin. Congratulations, Luigi. This is an interesting project and really deserving of its best thesis award. My staple is K-drama and have not seen films since the lockdown. But Lu J says I was with her, uh, the one who badgered her the most during her thesis writing. So I deserve to be her reactor. So this is my 10 cents worth. There are three things that impress me in this presentation. The first is the way film and literature are melded together in a scholarly way. Usually, we treat film the way we treat a literary text. We look for plot, character, theme, historical and theoretical context, etc. But in this study, film and literature combine forces to produce history. As the paper says, there is absence of matter. And so this absence is the push factor to create a presence through unconventional means. The creation of presence through scholarship is a wonderful thing to me, almost hologrammatic in its intent and production. The search for filmic presence through the Catholic magazines is not just research. It is creating a virtual, historical, and literary reality of the times. The two Spanish priest authors are an episteme of the Philippine film world in the early 20th century articulating the biases and contentions, not only of the Catholic Church, but also of the Filipinos in general. More importantly, they are in themselves the characters no, in this historical narrative of Philippine cinema. We can imagine Alonso de Mudara in his theatrical Katarayan, no, shredding un-Catholic films to shreds. Then there is the calmer, Philadelphia, who tried to be more objective and enlightened, uh, maybe a precursor of Boy Abunda, at least in temperament, but who probably got tired of the burdensome task of writing about films and stopped altogether. The study did not only create history, but also made these personages come alive as in a literary text. The second thing is the research. Lu J must have scoured the archives of UP and UST looking for these old texts buried in, the uh, buried in the old cabinets. Those of us who have done archival work know the, difficult the difficulties and the almost backbreaking work involved in retrieving old materials, which are usually disintegrating if they have not been digitized yet. I'm also impressed with the fact that the materials are in Spanish. Luje is either fluent in Spanish or had them translated. If it is the latter, she must have suffered frustrating delays in her work. That being said, what this study has significantly done 
is to resurrect the primary materials from oblivion and render them functional and meaningful. The third thing is the study's contribution to scholarship on Philippine cinema. While there is a general notion that cinema in the Philippines is an American thing, the study says that the church's interest in it and the publications in Spanish brought it beyond Hollywood and contributed a certain amount of cosmopolitanism, as the study says, to the publication's readers. This pocket of data creates a more comprehensive picture of our cinematic history. Many of the questions I want to ask Luje already have already been asked in the last part of his of her study. No, inunahan mo kami, so naunahan tayo. So if she can answer some of them, it will be good. But here are some of mine. Number one, uh, you gave a definition of the term realist histor historiographic. Uh, but may I ask you to elaborate more on the definition of the term? I am curious what the word realist here means. So that's the first one. The second one, is Cultura Social the only magazine with film reviews? Were there no contemporary publications in English? If there were, why did you choose to study the publications in Spanish? And number three, is there literature on how film critics are regarded by the audience of these publications like Cultura Social? Were they regarded with respect or were they denigrated as hobbyists or showbiz people? Okay, that's all. That's all my comments. Thank you. <laughs>